History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. Uh, this is lecture three. Uh, Constitution Problems, November 17th, 1964. Ladies and gentlemen, I learned today of the death of one of my oldest and closest friends. I find it almost impossible to concentrate my thoughts as much as I ought, both for your sake and my own. However, I did not wish to cancel the lecture, and so ask you for your forbearance. Last time I talked about the difficulty of a theory of history that presents itself to the naively scientific but philosophically pre-critical mind. This difficulty is that of grasping that something objective has primacy over human beings, who nevertheless think of themselves as the most certain reality. This fits in with the conception of history and the philosophy of history based on it as an assemblage of facts which then have to be interpreted in their indirect, derived context. It is held to be legitimate to investigate this context even though it really presupposes a larger framework that encompasses the individual subjects. Now, precisely because dialectics is necessarily and permanently concerned with a critique of mere facticity, of mere immediacy, I should wish not to ignore or neglect the element of truth contained in facts. Everyone who, like me, had the experience of having his house searched early in the National Socialist regime will now full well will know full well that such an event has an immediate impact that is greater than any attempt to seek out its causes however convincingly these may be explained in the newspapers. Explanations, for example, to the effect that the National Socialists have seized power, that the police have been granted certain powers, and other statements of the same sort. A fact like a house search in which you do not know whether you will be taken off somewhere or whether you will escape with your life has a greater immediacy for the knowing subject than any amount of political information itself on the level of the facts, to say nothing of the so-called larger historical context to which only reflection and ultimately theory can give us access. At the same time, this immediate knowledge that we need to hold on to as one element, something that no theory of dialectics may ignore, is no more than immediate knowledge for us. In itself, the fact of such a house search, however unpleasant it may be and however horrifying the threats lurking within it, is no more, despite its immediate impact, than the expression of the change of government, the abolition of legal safeguards under the emergency laws made permanent by the Nazis and similar factors. In the final analysis, it is the product of the, change, of the changing social structures that it led to the fascist dictatorship as a result of the special conditions obtaining in Germany between 1929 and 1933. In all probability, the concept of the fact can itself only be grasped as an element in an overall process. Individual facts can only be spoken of as part of a context which then manifests itself in these individual facts. The very concept of fact ensures that it cannot be insulated from its surrounding environment, just as I could probably not have really experienced that house search if I had not connected it in my mind with the political events of the winter and spring of 1933. If all that had happened was that two relatively harmless officials belonging to the old police force had turned up on my doorstep, and if I had had no knowledge of the complete change in the political system, my experience would have been quite different from what it was. And in the same way, no one can appreciate the terrors of a totalitarian regime if he has not personally experienced that ominous knock at the door and opened it to find the police waiting outside. I should like to take this opportunity of defending myself against an attack or a criticism to which dialectics is exposed, but one simply takes it to mean when in fact it does mean in large stretches of Marx's writings, namely as something that is no more than a critique of the immediacy of the immediate. In other words, as the demonstration that what appears to be brute fact is in reality something that has become what it is, something conditioned and not an absolute. A further factor should not be overlooked. 
if the dialectic is not simply to degenerate into something like a superstition or a trivial pursuit. By referring something back to the conditions that prove immediacy to have been conditioned, you do indeed strike a blow against immediacy, but that immediacy survives nevertheless. For we can speak of mediation only if immediate reality, only if primary experience survives. It would therefore be just as foolish to demand of history that it should concentrate solely on the so-called context, the larger conditioning factors, as it would be for historiography to confine itself to the depiction of mere facts. The construction of theoretical frameworks alone, without confronting the facts, really can lead to large-scale delusions. We may think here of attempts to explain the historical fate of mankind, the division into rich and poor in such matters in terms of racial origins, as was attempted as early as the 19th century by writers such as Gobineau. So the point about dialectics is not to negate the concept of fact in favor of mediation or to exaggerate that of mediation. It is simply to say that immediacy is itself mediated, but that the concept of the immediate must still be retained. Ladies and gentlemen, what I am saying to you here, and what probably sounds to you like a chapter from a dialectical or speculative book on logic, is of the most immediate importance for the subject of these lectures. For we, have been for we have been concerned here with the relations between the universal and the particular, the course of history and the individual. And, needless to say, when confronted with the general trend, the encompassing process, the individual inevitably has something of the immediacy of individual human experience of which I have been speaking. And if, as will gradually emerge from these lectures, we insist on this concept of the particular as opposed to the universal, on the grounds that in its present form the universal is no true universal, then the justification for doing so is that even if we accept that the individual is itself a manifestation, that individuality is itself a historical category, we must likewise accept that it is a historical category that cannot simply be set aside. It is rather the case that the immediacy of individuality, that is to say, of the individual being who is concerned to preserve his own existence, is just as truly an element of the dialectic as the predominant universality. But it is only an element and one that should no more be overemphasized abstractly than the universal. That is the reason why I wish to insist on this point. However that may be, in the dominant view, the larger encompassing context, the context that is not to be immediately grasped in, let us say, factual accounts, is generally taken to be a form of theory and is therefore consigned to philosophy and the realm of controversy in the spirit of the division of labor. It finds itself relegated by the general scientific consensus to the status of a kind of sauce or the final sh chapter in historical narrative, one that does not need to be taken too seriously. One instance of this can be seen in Simmel's book on the history of philosophy, which I have now referred to several times. In this book, every speculation about history, and indeed every attempt to conceptualize history, appears to be treated as a subjective stylization that may, that may be unavoidable but one that is also exposed to all the risks of relativism. This is a view that seems to me to be worthy of criticism. It can also be found in an extreme form in Theodore Lessing's, Lessing's book, History as Giving Meaning to the Meaningless, a book that I nevertheless find remarkable in its own way and commend to you as an example of a negative philosophy of history. I should point out, however, that a chasm separates the so-called idealism of a semi-Kantian such as Simmel from Hegel's absolute idealism, and that it is in their theory of history that they can be seen to be at their most antithetical. Paradoxically, Hegel's theory of the objective nature of history has a far greater realism than Simmel's in the sense that this objectivity has a far greater validity in actuality. I would make only one general point in criticism of Simmel this is that the entire problem presented itself in a manner that was typical of grand philosophy in the late 19th and early 20th century. It manifested itself in the concept of the constitutum, 
what was constituted, in other words, the way in which both objects and the truth were constituted, was not explored in a radical fashion in this philosophy. Instead, thinking took place in an already constituted world, in which already constituted human beings behave in various ways towards already constituted objects of knowledge, and where these forms of behavior are investigated in their turn. We may say that this procedure is roughly analogous to so-called subjective economics, marginal utility theory, in which exchange relations within an already constituted barter society are analyzed without inquiring into the way in which the exchange relationship, its true objective meaning, has been constructed. At bottom, for all his subtleties, Simmel's analysis is lacking in reflection. He is concerned with the way in which an existing mind relates to already existing facts. I want to confine my criticism purely to the essential issue, simply to clarify its relevance to our own problem here. The point is that what is secondary according to his theory, namely what we owe to the knowing mind, the course of history, the historical trend, the dynamic of history that prevails despite the efforts of human beings, that secondary aspect is in reality the thing that constitutes objective reality. It is in fact the objective nature of history in which individual subjects have their being that has primacy over all the human subjects that according to him are supposed to give shape to history. Simmel's entire philosophy then is marked by methodological historian proteron, a putting of the cart before the horse. And I would say that this is one of the underlying experiences that have been engendered by the historical events of our own age. Simmel died in 1918 and so does not properly belong to our own period. He still tended to think of history in much the same way as the joke lines in Faust, in which history takes place in faraway Turkey where armies come to blows. What in his lifetime could be shaped and inspected, like a like a collection of china in a glass case, has in the meantime come far too close for comfort. Confronted with this change, the very idea of the historian who can choose and shape events to his own taste and in accordance with his own interests has faded into myth, a myth which in the good old days Simmel could still mistake for the objective thrust of history itself. The fact is that we can only properly experience the objective nature of history as opposed to its supposed subjective shaping, once we realize that we are its potential victims. And that has become possible for individuals only with the world wars and the emergence of totalitarian rulers. You can see from this how historical developments can influence our own attitudes to history. In a given situation, a social system, and above all the dynamics intrinsic to such a system, has unconditional primacy over the human subjects who perceive them, and who, according to Simmel, are the agents of primary historical categories. I would go even further and say that, just as in general historical events have retroactive effects, this also holds good in this instance. That primacy, in other words, also existed in Simmel's own day and only failed to make its presence felt because of the distance of the observer from the events of history. Um, if there is any truth in the epistemological claims of naive realism, as expounded by materialism in its vulgar phase, then we see it precisely at this point. This was what was, uh, this was what was uppermost in the minds of dialectical materialists when they insisted upon the reality of society as opposed to psychological subjectivism. For this had been their own experience. Their mistake was merely that they tried to express their insight in the language of epistemology. For that brought about a relapse into the dogmatic assertion of a history that existed in itself, without showing any awareness of the problems of constitution I have been describing to you. This is what I should like to stress to you by way of salvaging the reputation of those so-called vulgar writers, who in many respects really were crude and epistemologically naive, and who admittedly looked quite different in the light of the self-reflection and self-criticism of a traditional subjectivist epistemology.
even from a Hegelian point of view, the vulgar thesis, the no less vulgar thesis that history is purely subjective in constitution, would be quite untenable. Even the subject's resistance to the pre-existing categories facing him is mediated by the categories in which he is enmeshed. In consequence, even in the high bourgeois phase in which the sovereign freedom of the perceiving human subject is at its greatest, his freedom is vastly more circumscribed than appeared to be the case. By way of illustration, I need only refer to Joseph de Maistre, the philosopher of the Restoration in France. De Maistre is, in general, a very remarkable figure, and it is certainly worth taking the trouble to look at him more closely. At the time of the so-called Restoration in France, de Maistre attempted, with extraordinary acid assiduity, we must say, to develop a critique of democratic society. It can be shown, however, and I have to restrict myself here simply to a passing reference, that the highly rational and polished logic which de Maistre deploys in his attack on rational and liberal society presupposes the entire pan panoply of sophisticated ideas that had been produced by the process of emancipation. In the 18th century, or indeed in an age when the feudal system was secure in its own beliefs, thinking of the kind seen in de Maistre would have been inconceivable. In his defense of the Ancien Régime, he necessarily marshals all the rational arguments that had brought about its demise. And if we may say so after the fact, he is helping to undermine the same conservative forces that he is defending. This is because the ideas he advances in their defense are of precisely the same kind as the necessarily egalitarian rationality whose substance he assails. That, incidentally, is a situation that I can only touch on here. I wish only to remind you of it since it is a situation of enormous importance and with widespread ramifications for historical theory. Resistance to speculation or the desire to restrict it epistemologically is merely derivative and secondary in the face of this priority of the course of history to which we have been harnessed. I would go so far as to say that today the resistance to speculation, like the ideology of positivism in general, tends rather to become the ideology whose adversary it imagines itself to be. The less free people are in history, and the more they feel themselves to be in the grip of the universal necessity that, thanks to the coherence of the social system of a given epoch, stamps its imprint on the dynamic of history, the historical age, the more desperately eagle, eager they are to assert that their own immediate experience is ultimate and absolute in nature. It follows, too, that they have an altogether greater interest in turning the situation upside down and misconstruing as a mere matter of speculation or arbitrary thought what in reality is the ens realis, realissimum, except that we should Oh no, that we should take care not to confuse the ens realissimum with the summum bonum, the greatest good. A common error in the philosophical tradition. Pre-critical thought is aware of this and must not allow its experience to be devalued by this confusion of the logical ground with the real one. I should like now, with your permission, to return to what I said at the beginning of this lecture, namely my experience when my house was searched. This was something that might have cost me my life, and in that event it would have been the thing with the greatest reality of all. Immediately, however, it was real only as the logical explanation of the horror that I felt quite drastically and directly, while, of course, its real cause was not the fact that the doorbell had rung or that these particular policemen had appeared at my front door because they had received orders to do so but in fact the nature of the system as a whole that had led them to act in that way. Hence, when I object to false immediacy, to turning the immediate into an absolute, what I have in mind in the first instance is this confusion of the logical explanation, or rather the immediate cause of an experience with the real cause, that is to say with the total historical context and its direction on which we are all dependent. In Hegel, we find that these ideas have at least been registered in the shape of objective idealism. Because of its identification of all existence with spirit, 
Objective idealism has as its object the freedom to concede to existence, the actual power that existence has over us. In the final analysis, this is not the least of the reasons that enabled idealist dialectics to give birth to the materialist variety by virtue of a small judgment or small adjustment. Just how small is something we can no longer imagine today? Feuerbach must have sensed it when he wrote his famous letter to Hegel, in which he attempted to demonstrate that Hegel was already an anthropological materialist. Unfortunately, Hegel's response to this letter has not been preserved. Now, what Hegel calls the world's spirit is the spirit that asserts itself, despite people's wishes, over their heads, as it were. It is the primacy of the flow of events in which they are caught up, and it impinges on them no less than do the facts. Only it does so less painfully, and is therefore the more easily repressed. What is important here is that you should not regard this idea of the spirit prevailing over people's heads as a kind of speculative prejudice, and hence to miss it all too readily. It is important, I say, that you should realize that this is a process in which what prevails always passes not merely over people's heads, but through them. One of the most widespread misunderstandings of Hegel, in my opinion, is what I have recently termed the priority of the subject. This is a misunderstanding that must be eliminated if we wish to gain a proper appreciation of the problem we are discussing. It is essential that where such things as spirit or reason are under discussion, you should not imagine that we are faced with a secularization of, let us say, the divine plan that floats above mankind, but minus the person of God. There's no suggestion here that there is such a thing as providence, but no provident being, and that the divine plan is somehow fulfilled independently of mankind. Matters are not so simple. I believe that if you want to understand what I am saying and what I think of as the real task of these lectures, you should not start thinking about such independent embodiments of the spirit separate from human beings, but quite simply about such things as what is meant by the spirit of the age. What I mean by this is that if you travel around Fran Franconia or elsewhere in southern Germany or Austria, you will be able to see how in the 17th century all the surviving Romanesque and Gothic churches and chapels were suddenly given a Baroque facelift. It is as if they were all under the same spell. Or think for a moment of the way in which every little cafe suddenly becomes ashamed of its cozy atmosphere and tries to update itself by installing neon lighting so as to give itself a more functional look. If you think of the spirit of the age in these terms, you will come closer to what I have in mind than if you think of the influence of an objective spirit as something terribly meaningful and theological, although needless to say, I would not wish to dispute that in its origins, with, we undoubtedly are witnessing something like the secularization of the theological divine plan of the world. Nevertheless, Hegel and the dialectical view of history were far too considered and far too critical not to notice uh, not to notice that. If such a process of secularization is to succeed, it cannot be achieved if the divine plan or the new objective reality are allowed to retain the same predicates that they once possessed in the theological scheme of things. In this respect, Hegel was a genuine philosopher of mediation and also an, an Aristotelian in the sense that he attempted to define the spirit that prevails over mankind as something also that also prevails in them. I believe that it is very important insofar as such matters have any importance at all, but since you have come here in such large numbers, you and I both indulge in the fiction that we are talking about very important matters, so that I can assume that this fiction remains valid. With this reservation then, I believe that it is very important to remember that the objective course of history asserts itself over human beings in such a way that no single mind and no single human will suffice. No human will suffices truly and effectively to resist it. And at the same time, it asserts itself through human beings. By this, I mean that they appropriate and identify with what is expressed slight, slightly, vaguely, perhaps, by the English term, the trend. And even this is to define it far too superficially, for in reality, and this is where Hegel's philosophy of history coincides with classical economic theory and also with Marx,
The fact that people pursue their own individual interests makes them at the same time the exponents and, ex and executors of that same historical objectivity that is ready to turn against their interests at any moment, and thus may assert itself over their heads. There is a contradiction here, since it is claimed that what asserts itself despite people's own efforts does so by virtue of them, by virtue of their own interests. But since the society in which we live is antagonistic, and since the course of the world to which we are harnessed is antagonistic too, what we might term this logical contradiction should not be thought of as merely a contradiction, merely the product of an inadequate formulation. It is a contradiction that arises from the situation. To put it in metaphysical terms, it states simply that the very constraints that are imposed on people by the course of the world and that compel them to attend to their own interests and nothing beyond them is the very same force that turns against people and asserts itself over their heads as a blind and almost unavoidable fate. It is this structure of things that leads us to the point I have been aiming at, namely a conception of the philosophy of history that permits us to comprehend history, that is to say to go beyond its bounds as mere existence, and to understand it as something meaningless. And this meaninglessness is itself nothing but the dreadful antagonistic state of affairs that I have been attempting to describe to you. So the primacy of universal reason is not to be understood as the primacy of some substantive rational force beyond human beings that directs human actions, and this is something I should like you to understand, since I regard it as of prime importance for the theory of history. You can best understand it perhaps if you think of various turns of phrase that you will have come across in your own experience. I am thinking of such phrases as the logic of events, or the phrase used by Franz von Sickingen that I have cited in earlier lectures. As he lay on his deathbed having been mortally wounded during a siege, something of a, of a professional hazard for, or for a condottiere, he is said to have remarked, not without cause. The belief that all things are proper and above board, that events can be understood sub step by step, that even the worst and most meaningless suffering can be comprehended as the product of overall circumstances. This and this alone is what we are to understand as the world spirit of which Hegel spoke. And I can add right away that we should put a large question mark here about whether this world spirit is truly a world spirit, or rather its exact opposite. At any rate, all facts are transmitted by virtue of the primacy of this process in which things happen over people's heads and through them. Or, more precisely, what characterizes this primacy is that events assert themselves over people's heads because they assert themselves in people's minds themselves. And this primacy takes precedence over the facts. It is no mere epiphenomenon. You can see this from the fact that it is mere chance whether someone who has his house searched in a totalitarian regime, as I did, escapes with his life or is killed. In contrast, the trend that ensures that people's houses are searched, that people live in constant fear, and that they are unable to discover whether or not they will be caught up in such events, we might go so far as to say this random element is not itself random. It is part of the objective tendency of which I have been speaking. It is this situation that we need to be able to penetrate and to succeed in penetrating such mysteries as the truth of what is so frequently vilified as the metaphysics of history. At the same time, and this is something we need to bear in mind as well, I have already pointed this out but would like to repeat it, such things are impenetrable because human beings are not pace Hegel at home with themselves. Because the meaning that history has as the logic of events is not the meaning of individual destinies. On the contrary, the meaning of history always comes across to the individual as something blind, heteronomous, and potentially destructive. And this unity of the to be penetrated and the impenetrable, or if I may express it differently, the unity of unity and discontinuity is in fact the problem of the philosophy of history and how to theorize it.